Good morning and welcome to the session Future Proof Government, Reinventing Government Services and Preparing for the Post-COVID-19 Hybrid Digital Society. I am so pleased to have Kai Huhart, Group VP, Strategic Business Development for Public Sector and Defence with me. With us today, he will take us through why digital government platforms are essential to government transformation. Please do use the Q&A function to post any questions you have for us, and we will take the time to answer as many of these as possible at the end of the session. Kai, the floor is yours. Hello, welcome. Here is um, Kai from the Netherlands. Uh, very welcome to my uh, short presentation in these uh, difficult times, uh, but very challenging and everything doing online. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So I will quickly um, take you through some of my uh, topics that I have been uh, working on for the last couple of years, I can even speak, but now, especially, of course, in what we call the COVID-19 crisis and mainly looking forward what that would be in the post-COVID crisis. So I'm not going to give you some quick solutions uh, or quick gains. I'm trying to explain a little bit what would be the impact in the public sector on government and how to make that ready for the next step once we have the uh, crisis controlled and how that works together with uh, the already uh, challenges of many governments to become e-states, uh, digital nations, uh, how that ends up, as I call it, the hybrid society. So it's all about uh, using platforms, the digital government technology platforms, how to get there ultimately to really reinvent government services, because I am very much of the opinion that we have a golden moment uh, together with all the governments um, in the world. So what I have done recently, and actually is going to be pushed out today and tomorrow on the social media, LinkedIn and Twitter, is written two opinion papers on what I call future-proof government and the hybrid society. And what I mean with hybrid, I'll come to that in a second, uh, finding the balance between the, the online services and our physical presence, uh, and how that impacts at the same time with leadership expected from governments by citizens uh, to address the challenges that we're looking on, especially now in the crisis and post COVID. So using platforms, how that will change and help governments move forward. Because if there's one thing that we can be sure of is that the, the digital, the more online services we are looking at is not going away. So we'll see, and I'll explain it in a minute also, how that will be as a uh, irrevisible change. So next to those two, uh, keep uh, posted, I will write a third paper, which is then uh, sort of a series of three on this new, uh, towards the new normal. And that focuses a little bit more on the, what kind of intelligent digital services for citizens we would look at, uh, not to be different, but actually doing things um, <coughs> differently. So that's also on GovTex and uh, who will be the, the forerunners. So let's look at what this digital government, this sort of future proof would look like. I think we are at the age of, uh, at, at, a, at a new age for government. And, and interestingly, if you look from a, a bird's eye view on the globe, you will see that all 193, according if we count the UN, countries that actually face the similar challenges. So they, they are all in the same position in terms of transition adopting the online digital uh, society. And, and that base is also uh, an interesting view in terms of trying to compare which countries are more mature in their transformation and which are 
still following. Now I'll give some ex examples, uh, and that's also what I describe in my papers. Uh, also focusing on, on that actually doing things different. So we're not just talking about doing it better as a government, giving the services to your citizen, but also doing it differently. And that is especially something that we have to have the dialogue with government in terms of what we put on the agenda, because the typical reaction would also be just to automate this existing bureaucracy. Especially using data, and I'll come to talk about data lakes, using the algorithm and the AI, you would actually be able to function differently and much, much more advanced as a government. So, of course, we will try to try uh, the issues of privacy. I'll come to that. But you would actually use the terms that you see recently in different contexts is about the ones only or even the no touch government. So how would be the impact on that and how would that address the citizen? That's the kind of challenges we're facing. That's on the agenda. That's what we want to share with the other branches, what the best practices are. And actually showing in a time realizing that what some call the golden age now for public administrations. So now to this term of hybrid, uh, the hybrid society. Um, we all know our existing physical environment. We all know where to go to city hall or in the campus and the, the bricks. And realizing that we already have had a number of online services, uh, even before the, the, the COVID crisis. But now during that crisis, and that's over the last three to four months, we suddenly see a huge rise of online services. So suddenly, because of the social distancing, it was possible to get this full curriculum of education without even going to class or see a professor. So you also see that at city halls or getting your, your plan submitted or getting allowances from the ministry or talking to a doctor or even getting elderly care at home from online services. So all that is coming has come towards us is already here. And in my opinion, is not going to go away. People find even working from home that it is indeed sometimes better to work from home instead of just going nine to five to the offices. That doesn't mean that we will never see each other again because that physical presence of course is important. But what we're looking at is the integration of this huge amount of new online services, which will only increase and see that combined with our physical society around us. That's the new normal. That's the new hybrid society we're looking at. And that's what we have to discover in terms of the way that would work. There's no clear solution on that once forever, but there is something to work on. And that all relates to the way that we work with data, interpreting data, letting the data work for us and being able to give that seamless user experience integration of online services and the physical world. Now again, going bird's eye to the globe, if we look at all the governments around the world these days, they all have some sort of digital agenda on their digital transformation, becoming an e-state, becoming a digital nation, smart nation, however you want to call it. So why is South Australia having this digital agenda also to be visible down under in the globe, to be visible for entrepreneurs, for students, for investors, to come to Australia and to, to work with them? Online present is key on that. In Belgium, it has been addressed very much to cut on all the administration levels that they have in the, in the, in the Belgium territory. And that could work as well in terms of having a clear agenda why you're digitalizing. So New Zealand has the same challenge as one of the front runners in digital nations in increasing, making it easy for people outside New Zealand as well in New Zealand to be working online. Now, it's not only about growth and it's not only about uh, attracting tourists and entrepreneurs to your country, but it's also about controlling your current society. Typically, India is trying to digitalize rapidly to get some sort of grip on their huge population, but also China 
is having, of course, a very specific view on how you would use data, data lakes, uh, digital transformation to to work in their in their uh, huge country. And that is more related, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's not what I'm discussing here. It's more about looking at an example, how data would work in a digital society, what you can do with it. And of course, the example uh, many know uh, about what's happening in China in terms of petabytes of data that they're using in the public uh, society in terms of also controlling their 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 population so being aware that you have all these cameras and cctv including face recognition all the data of everyone moving around in china is absolutely a huge mass the question is what do you do with that data the question is how do you store it and and and, and make it work for you in such a way and also taking into account the privacy terms so even privacy in China is, uh, is an issue, even though uh, it's not, not much talked about. But it is an example in terms of how you would use it uh, in the public society to make it more efficient to work with. And again, I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm giving it as an example. And if you look over the past five years, that you, transformation using data in the Republic of China is massive. So also in terms of looking at examples, what you do not want in your government to work with, it is a very great, good example. And interesting here, and this is uh, one of my interns from the Chinese university working with me and showing her credit score. So actually China is showing off this, what I call 100% digital twin in public society. And I need to emphasize again, and I'm not discussing the right or wrong use terms. I'm just giving it as an example, how you can look what you can do with data up to the extreme. So in that Chinese example, it's very much about actually getting full access to whatever a person is doing and put that in the digital twin. And based on that data, they put in the algorithms. No one knows how that black box works which could be worrying, but at the same time, you get all your service delivered from government in a seamless way. Now, going to another example is Estonia. Uh, I can say as a Dutchman, I am an Estonian resident. So I'm also going through that tour in terms of how that works. But typically in Estonia, they have also chosen to work more, uh, not to speak as a data lake, but more in terms of what we have in some other countries is an issue that the departments are just working out of their silos. So each department for tax or for justice or home affairs has its own data on citizens and do not share it. So in my experience, I'm talking to many governments around the world and you see a lot of pressure going now towards the departments by either by changing the legislation in terms of that the government has to share its own information, keeping in mind, of course, the privacy rules. And that is still a challenge to go on. We see with police already, it's much easier going beyond the privacy issues and being able to share data in order to prevent terrorism. That's clear. But once you go into services for citizens, it's a different story. Now, that is something that we uh, also look at. An interesting example in Estonia, they've they sort of turned it around by saying, OK, so if I share my data with my government, if I give consent to that, then the question is based on what's in it for me. So if you take it from that perspective, then it could also be working that the, that the citizen would actually be willing to give consent to use to use your data in order to get the better services from their government. And already in healthcare, you will see that happen with patients getting extremely sick. And then of course they will want to share all their personal electronic data forms uh, together. But this is not in a crisis. This is in, in case of Estonia based on trust. And that's a very interesting view, which I touch on in my papers as well, in terms of how you would actually be <clears throat> uh, viewing that. So having said that on the Chinese example in Estonia, that also comes where I said before, in terms of where government is going, in terms uh, what we call the fourth dimension, which is then data. Those data lakes, in my opinion, will will arise. 
we will go through so much data points and sharing of the uh, digital twin that we as a government have to advise them in terms of how could you control those data lakes and keep it keep it in such a way that it is in line and then you come a little bit on the geo historical uh, background in terms of where governments and countries are coming from and as an example here uh, showing well the more american way of looking at using ai and data for profit selling the data uh, by the tech giants and as i explained with china where it's much more used for control of the mass and europe is trying to make an answer which is more looking at the humanitarian way as we like to have the soft power of the european union definitely now on the commissioner <clears throat> the commission with the uh, lion it's very much looking at how can we be not a safe haven, but more a way of setting the standards in terms of how we are working with data for citizens, accepting that we will work with data lakes based on the GDPR, looking maybe also on giving consent from citizens in terms of how you want to use that and give that profile to be become a worldwide standard. So that is a very interesting development that also that needs to be discussed with government in terms of where they want to be. Because just to, to say as an example, uh, there's also many governments who are looking at the Chinese system and the way they're working with this kind of data lakes in an AI and they're already copying it from there. So it's not only the European way or the American way, but there's a variety on this globe to work with. So to zoom in uh, on the European data strategy, so there's a lot on, uh, on the agenda for the commissioner for the Commission um, and the Gaia X project that you may have heard of is also a step towards figuring out how we can work with our data in Europe according to our privacy rules and not being dependent on mainly the, the US players as we speak here in Europe. Um, that strategy is based as part of the Green Deals, the new way from the Commission of Forwards uh the new way of working with data and apart from sustainability and eco economic growth digitization is very high on the agenda so in this new normal in this new hybrid society we were looking at with government is very much also looking at your data strategy so having said that The issue what I'm touching based on as well in my papers and opinion, and again, this is too much to explain, of course, in such a short presentation, but just to show you where we were coming from, the acceptance of digital government technology platforms is key in terms of your transformation. And some still consider a platform something like uh, a multiple uh, environment of servers, but it's an ecosystem, what it's all about. And this ecosystem, which is also in line with uh, Gartner, is also a way to, in, to show governments which way they have to put their agenda. Because there's one thing sure, as I said in the beginning as well, so we'll get more data, we get more challenges in terms of how the data works together, we should be aware where data is actually going to work by itself instead of manually controlled by human beings. And in order to challenge that data and working on it, you need bigger platforms. You cannot do it just on the base of your own IT in your basement, as still many governments try to do. So that doesn't mean everything has to go to the public cloud or to the baron, to, to outside your country or your, your sovereignty. You need to keep that control. And that's also why the ecosystem of platforms is organized. So again, I'll, I'll show some examples in my papers. And, and one of the things I'm doing on, on the site uh, in, in, in discussing with governments about their, their current position and where they want to go. So what is their agenda? Why do they want to digitalize? What is the challenge they want to confront? And how do you approach the control of data? 
So one of the things I'm starting doing in research with the university in the Netherlands is benchmarking e-states from left to right. So again, this is a mock-up I'm making and that is still to be discussed how you position that. But if you look at that in comparison of what other governments do in peer-to-peer, it also strengthens the story, it strengthens the best practices in terms of getting examples from others to show you this is the way we have to go or this is not the way we go. So strategy is key. Strategy is about what you want as a government, as an administration. Some countries are very clear on, on those strategies and transform to digital society very rapidly. Others are still considering what kind of society they want to be. But this change, this change that we are looking at at this, uh, at this moment, given the, the crisis we are in, given the fact that we have to integrate this, all these new online services in such a way in our society that it actually becomes a society. We are at the moment all over the world in a position to reshape government. And that I think is also a game changer that we have to bring in the conversation about this new normal. So I would like to conclude here. Uh, again, I've given you some of my highlights and some of the topics I am addressing. Again, follow me on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter uh, or on the uh, websites of Atos. My papers will be published today and tomorrow, uh, and there is more to come. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Go over to Denise. Thanks, Kai, and thank you for a really uh, interesting presentation. And just a reminder um, that Kai's two new white papers are available on LinkedIn and Twitter today for you to download today. So we've received um, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, uh, can you please, Kai, elaborate more on work done with Australia? That's an interesting question. Um, I think Australia, we have been working on, um, on, let's say, I started working with the Australian government since 2014, so I've been there a couple of times. And clearly the agenda in Australia is also very much about you know, the changing economy, uh, the physical world, the mining industry, uh, the total uh, economic growth and digital digitalization online services are typically brought in to 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 strengthen the economy to strengthen the the visibility on on getting investors students as I said uh, uh, strengthening the economy so digitalization is not only about cost reduction which is of course driver an uh, important one. But it's also about the visibility of uh, Australia in, in, in the world. So you need to be able to quickly, so to speak, to be online present, that people find you, that it is easy to do business with. Um, and at the same time, exploring the advantages of the huge country, the beautiful country, in terms also of safeguarding data, uh, and safeguarding uh, a society that is sustainable uh, and also being able to address all the, the current challenges. So yes, we have done a, a number of uh, governments, we are state governments we're working with together closely, and that is only going to increase for, for ATOS uh, in Australia. Thank you, Kai, thank you. Um, we have another question in. I would like to know more about what will be the future for countries which have had a very heavy COVID pressure in Europe, like Italy. Well, we are currently already addressing uh, during the crisis uh, very specific solutions to intensify the online services. So that could be from a workplace, that could be from a call center support to, to portals websites. So we are already addressing, as we address the, 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 the crisis itself, 
what I'm more looking into, so where would it, the, what would be the strategy of Italy in terms of once this crisis is over, once we are no longer required to do the social distancing, but still all these online education, online services, all this digital so twin, you could call, how would that integrate with the physical Italian society? That's a question I cannot answer from here. I'm giving the examples and the best practices of what other countries are doing and how they are trying, because everyone is in the middle of the transformation. It's not finished, it's just starting. But that will definitely drive the agenda for looking at the future of Italy. What kind of country do they want to be? And how do they want to embrace the digital society into making themselves ready to invest in growth and sustainability and green challenges and addressing the wealth gap and investing in the youth and the online accessibility for students and quickly get to their results in their curriculum. So it's, a, it's not just one answer we can give. To me, the most important part is the awareness that people are aware and seeing what's happening using the bird side to look at the different examples in other parts of the globe and combining that with your already existing agenda and address how do you digitize into this new hybrid society. Thank you, Kai, thank you. Um, I'm just looking to see anybody got any more questions they'd like as we've got a minute left. Please feel free to pose anything you would like to ask of Kai. Really interesting session. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you all so much for being in our live sessions. As I said earlier, there are white papers available for you to download today. Um, wonderful live session about future proof government. Um, oh, we have another question come in very quickly then. So we have many governments are trying to automate either bureaucracy in Europe as well. How could we explain to them this is wrong? Well, again, again you come to the point of the, 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 the strategy of the government, where they want to go. And I think a lot of the, the what would help if we show a mirror back to governments, not in terms of telling them they're doing things wrong, but showing them the alternatives that once you work with online services, you do not have to go through all the red tape and the paperwork. As a quick example, we now have seen in city councils, but also in departments where suddenly digital signatures and digital onla uh, online paperwork, uh, no, not paperwork, but digital uh, documents are, are now legally valid, meaning they can now do services, transactions, decision-making in government in an online way instead of everyone sitting in, in very long conference room. That will in drastically increase the decision-making process in governments, but it also will shorten the time and less need of all kinds of civil servants running around with all kinds of red tape paperwork. So that's a quick example in the end. And in my paper, I, I'll give uh, some more uh, examples. Thank you so much, Kai. Thank you. We squeezed that one in, which was brilliant. So thank you all so much for being in our live session. Thank you again to Kai. Um, and the recording will remain online for you all to look back at. Thank you so much. We will close the session. Thank you.